I am Valentina Picot. Picot. I am research advisor and conference manager at Fundacion Meru. And uh, I am, uh, I, uh, I'm sure many of you know, uh, had been here previously, so knows about Fundacion Meru, but I'm, I'm, some of you might not. And so I'm very happy to show you a little bit of who is Fundacion Meru and what we do. So um, Fundacion Meru, uh, uh, who we are, is a family foundation that was created in 1967. Uh, the foundation is non-lucrative and it was granted charity status in 1976. The foundation was uh, created by Charles Meru in honor of his father, Marcel Meru, which who used to be uh, a student of uh, Pasteur. Our mission is to strengthen local capacities in developing countries and emerging countries to reduce the impact of infectious diseases and vulnerable populations. So how do we do that? So we have a, an integrated approach that, that, that includes uh, collaborative research programs, creative networks and innovative healthcare infrastructures, training and knowledge sharing, building labs infrastructure and quality, and development of public health initiatives. So I will just give you quickly a glance of what, what does different uh, mission and approaches really mean within the, our strategy. So our main focus is to, local, to strengthen local applied research capacities for more accurate and timely identification of infectious diseases. The focus too is to improve quality and accessibility of clinical diagnosis. And focus three, which comes down to, to one for the, these conferences that we do here in the Pensier as well as internationally, is to promote knowledge sharing and dissemination of information on infectious diseases. So yeah, this slide is to show you quickly where we are located. We have laboratories uh, all over the world in uh, four continents. And, uh, and these laboratories are uh, used for different purposes on in the purpose of mi the mission of Fundacion Meru, either for research or for capacity building. And um, the latest laboratory that, that is being built is in Brazil, in uh, Rio Branca. And the latest laboratory that was actually uh, delivered was the one in Bangladesh uh, uh, last year. So the, this is uh, where we are, the global size where we are located. And it's important to say that these laboratories, even though they are built by Fundacion Meru or in sometimes in partnership with uh, evidently partners on site, they are uh, at the end of the, uh, the process, we intend that these laboratories are really uh, introduced and adopted by the countries and most of them end up belonging to the MHOs. So in, in our strategy focus one, which is strengthening research capacities, we just want to bring you a context in the, in the context that we work, which is emerging and developing countries. Where do we children die and where we, where we focus our research? And as you can see clearly from this map, the, the children die in, in those countries where we call today developing, emerging countries in India and obviously uh, developing countries Africa mainly. This is also um, just a slide to put on into context that out of 100 people added to the world's population in the next decade, 97 will live in developing countries. So demographically, we are spreading more and more to the developing countries in terms of population and density. So our collaborative research projects, as just to mention a few of them, lie on pneumonia, tuberculosis, fevers of different, different syndromic fever, fever and uh, other research projects such as uh, influenza uh, surveillance, that actually we, we have different partners working with us on that. Now it's a new project that we are launching, actually I'm, I'm leaving to Guinea to, to launch this project tomorrow, and it's on Ebola diagnostics research, and, and projects on HIV, HPV. So there is a big range of different projects on research that we work on. Um, to mention that uh, in order to work with this, in these projects, we have developed an international network of research laboratories in developing countries. Uh, this, this network is called Gabriel. And in the, in the network, we, uh, we have a specific cellules of research units in the different countries for, clinical, for the clinical components and the laboratory, co laboratory components that constitute the research projects that we do. Um, 
Um, the sec the, uh, our second focus then is the increase in access to quality and diagnosis. So we, we, ha we have our first focus, which is research mainly. And then this second focus is we create initiatives in order to build capacity of the countries to fight infectious diseases. A big ex an important example for us is the Resao Lab, which is the West African network of laboratories in which um, seven countries today are participant countries. It is expanding to Eastern Africa and uh, where, where we strengthen the clinical biology laboratory systems in terms of training, human capacity, the structural capacity and operational capacity of these countries. It was one of the, the uh, Ebola outbreak um, it was uh, show that the capacity building that we are doing with Resao Lab has, uh, has helped enormously in, to improve the surveillance of the con neighboring, neighboring countries and the affected countries in, in this uh, outbreak. Just to show you quickly what how Fundacion Merio has contributed to the fight against Ebola. So we um, analyzed what were the first to chip samples back to the P4, uh, P4 sorry, uh, to analyze uh, Ebola specimens from the affected countries. <coughs> Deployment of a laboratory specialist in the field like uh, Joseph Herr, to understand the capacity, the real activities that were happening in Ebola on site. The bulletin biosecurity training, so we, we trained 250 lab personnel training uh, so far in six West African countries, which belong to the, our Resao Lab initiative, and building a specific partnerships. So I don't want to go into the detail, but this is how Fundacion Merio has operated against the Ebola outbreak. Uh, on top of the research that we are launching next, next tomorrow. So um, sharing focus three, so sharing knowledge and fostering innovation. Um, so I will not go into the details, but Fundacion Merio contributes enormously in conferences around the world that evidently uh, touches infectious diseases aspects, uh, either here or, or internationally. And so we have a big portfolio of conferences running every year and obviously courses as well in diagnostics and vaccinology and uh, different uh, type of, of, the, of courses that we offer that last two or three weeks and that, that are now, now like the ADVAC well-recognized uh, courses. So, oops, sorry. One of the other aspects of knowledge sharing is the, that we host today the Partnership for Dengue Control Initiative that is, uh, is um, mission is to promote the development and implementation of innovative integrated synergistic approaches to the prevention and control of dengue. And it's an initiative that has gotten uh, important partners in the dengue control and is uh, moving forward. Just to say that we hosted last week the, the Ebola vaccine meeting, uh, which uh, counted with the important stakeholders as ABSAN, WHO, WHO, uh, vaccine developers and donor agen agencies. Just to give you a, 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 a glance of how our breakdown of income is. And uh, so we have an endowment income and investment of 25%. Uh, Sanofi Parcer contributes to 18% of our activities. Uh, and uh, as you see, several partnerships of 25%. So we have a, a, a donors and, and uh, income that comes from different partners and levels out our the mission of how we work. So just to show our main finding partners, uh, main operational partners all over the world, probably this, this list is not as far from being exhaustive, but just to give you a, a clue of who we work with. And uh, I just want to thank you for being with us today and uh, wishing you us all uh, an exciting three days event. And thank you again for, for joining us today. So uh, I welcome you also in my name to Les Pensiers. So I'm Jack Louis, I'm uh, retired, and I'm uh, uh, working with the Merieu Foundation to facilitate the organization of four to five meetings a year. So welcome, and just to, uh, to this uh, particularly uh, important meeting, and of course uh, I'm an immunologist, uh, medical doctor, but not a specialist in ecosystem of vaccination. So this program was really required the help of 
other people than me, I would like to cite uh, David, Professor David Blum, that who will give the keynote uh, lecture, Valentina, that you just heard, Stanley Plotkin, and Michael Watson. And I want to insist that Michael Watson is really le maître d'oeuvre of this meeting, who really inspire a lot in putting this uh, meeting together. Thank you, Michael. And then just for your information, so in this uh, type of program, we organize four to five meetings a year. And I list it here for those of you who are interested in uh, the meeting, uh, or the next meeting for the year 2015. And I'm sure uh, if you are interested, Cindy can provide you with the list of those meetings. So just a few announcements now. Uh, uh, I wish you a good conference. And uh, most of you know, uh, some of you have been here before. Uh, uh, we have, uh, normally, uh, we take uh, the speech, the PowerPoint slide of each speaker, and uh, every participant and speaker will receive, at the end of the conference Wednesday, Cindy, uh, Grasso will provide them with a USB key uh, containing all the presentation. So now I insist, if there are some presentation uh, that uh, the authors would like to remove some of the slide of their presentation before communicating to everybody, please mention it to Cindy and this will be made according to your wishes. So uh, no, a special uh, mentioned to Cindy. Uh, Cindy, as you know, most of them know her now. You have registered, and I want to thank her for the great job she does in organizing in C2 these conferences. So now I will give uh, the floor to Michael Watson, who really will summarize the spirit of the presentation, and then you have the keynote address. Please, Michael. Thank you, Jack, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm glad you all made it. I was worried the snow was going to stop you getting here, but now you're here, the worst that can happen is we get snowed in, and there are worse places in the world to be snowed in, so that's good. That's a good start. Um, my name is Michael Watson. I, I lead the global policy team at Sniffy Pasteur and, and had the, the, the pleasure and the privilege to be, to be part of the steering committee for this. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes just to uh, explain our, our vision for the meeting and what, what we'd like to get out of the next uh, day and a half, two days. I think the first thing to say is I don't believe we'd find anybody in this room who doubts the value of vaccination, the huge value of vaccination. And I think we all pretty much agree that we all need to do, and most of us do, as much as we can to maximise the amount of vaccination that gets out there. But we face a couple of challenges. I think the first is that it clearly it's a very complex system and managing a complex system is difficult. And that's really where the sort of ecosystem concept came from. We all know the stories of, of, of mismanaged ecosystems. The, the one I love best is the, is the Chinese operation in the 1950s to kill off all the sparrows because the sparrows were eating all the rice. So they went out there with their guns and they killed all the sparrows only for the locusts to arrive that the sparrows used to eat, and the locusts ate all the, all the rice, and thence followed a, a terrible famine. So one, one meddles with ecosystems at one's peril, and I think the world has learned that. So we really wanted to look at, look at this complex system and ask ourselves, how are we doing? Are we, do we have the right, the right fine touch that you need to manage something as an ecosystem? The other side is that we are so passionate about it that we may be holding on too tight, and it's what the economists call bounded rationality. When you feel so passionately, so strongly about something that actually um, you stop taking truly objective decisions about things, you stop taking an objective view and you start being too subjective. So um, what we wanted to do was step back, kick the tires, tap the knees, dip the oil, and just see how we're doing. And try and do it in as objective a way as possible. And so to do that, we have with us a group of some of the really most important policymakers in vaccination, so some real experts in vaccination. But we didn't want to just sit around and allow them to talk to each other, because they probably already have a view on things. So there's a very healthy smattering among you of economists, 
of business experts, of marketing experts, of people from foundations, uh, from people from NGOs, from development agencies. And I really ask that those of you that aren't deeply in the vaccine world, really, really make your voice known. If there are things that's, that, that come out and you really wonder about them, really want to ask questions, dig in there, ask the questions, challenge, challenge the vaccinologists, because we spend a lot of time together talking the same language. What I hope then we'll get out of this is, is well, actually, as you see, I'll be back standing up here at the end of, the, uh, of these next couple of days. I'd love to go away with a real a shopping list, some action, not just a talking shop, but some things that we all feel would be uh, of benefit to, the, to the, um, the sustainability, the longevity of the, of the vaccination ecosystem. So I'm going to stop there. Um, to kick us off, um, we thought we'd take a look to the future, see what the, uh, the future might look like. And who better to do that for us than Professor David Bloom? Uh, Professor Bloom is the Clarence James Gamble Professor of Economics and demography. And those of you who have had a chance to look at his um, biography will see that he fits more into a working year than most of us fit into a, into a working lifetime. So I'm not going to go through the list, but I think there are two things um, that are, I think, particularly relevant. The first is, is David's extensive worth, work on the co of bringing together economics and health, looking at health and wealth and how they, they mutually um, reinforce each other. And the other is um, in his, his role as chair of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on the future of the health sector. And so with that, David, if I could invite you to, to join us and, and tell us a little bit about where you see vaccination in the future.